All right, good morning and welcome to this joint hearing of the Vermont Legislature's General and Housing Committee and Committee on Environment and Energy. Um, this morning we are here to talk about S100, an act relating to housing opportunities made for everyone. Um, and in this joint hearing, I just want to kind of lay out the way that I'm seeing this unfold, which is um, as an opportunity for the two committees to share ideas and questions uh, about housing generally and S100 specifically, um, but not a place where we're going to debate policy, but rather communicate areas of interest and shared or concerns, questions that you have um, and you want to see addressed as we take the bills up. I'm going to start off by having, well, first of all, introduction. <laughs> Make sure we all know each other since we don't work with each other every day at least not in committee. And then I'll ask Tom, uh, Chair Stevens, to give an overview of what the General and Housing Committee did when they looked at the bill. And I'll talk about our process in our committee a little bit and then open it up to members to discuss. Does anyone have any questions about that part? Seeing any. Um, Representative Morris, would you start with introductions, please? Representative Morris, Springfield. Representative Bartley, uh, Franklin One. Representative Brian Smith, Orleans One from Derby. Representative Paul Tiffany, <laughs> Rutland City, Rutland Town. Representative <clears throat> Seth Bongartz, Bennington Four. Robin Chestnut Andrewman, Rutland Bennington District. Um, Representative Tom Stevens, Washington Chittenden. Representative Amy Sheldon from Middlebury, which is Addison 1. Representative Laura Sevilla, Wyndham 2. Representative Kathleen James from Manchester and Bennington 4. Larry Sadkowitz, Orange, Washington, Addison. Representative Dennis LeBounty, Linden, Newark, Sutton, Sheffield, Wheelock. Joe Parsons, I represent the beautiful towns of Newberry, Topsom, and Groton. Good morning, I'm Larry Labor. I represent Essex, Orleans, District 1. Representative Emily Krasnow, South Burlington. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, Bur <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Elizabeth Burroughs and I represent uh, Windsor One, which is Heartland, West Windsor in Windsor. Hi, I'm Representative Dara Torrey and I represent Washington Two, Moortown, based in Duxbury, Waitsfield and Warren. All right, thank you all. Uh, Representative Stevens. Thank you, Representative Sheldon. And thank you um, to the to the Energy and Environment Committee for having for hosting this meeting. Um, we are going to talk about S one hundred and about the work that we did. Um, it was a bill that, if you looked at how it was introduced, it said land use and housing. And I think that there's a general consensus that the two go hand in hand. Um, but what we experienced, of course, in our committees is that um, the oversight of land use is the purview of the Energy and, Envi uh, and Environment and Energy Committee and housing is the General and Housing Committee, but there's needless to say there's interplay between the two. And so we just wanted to have the opportunity to share what we did and how we addressed the housing portions of the bill, because as it came over from the Senate, it was quite different than what was passed out of committee in its original version. And we also added some some material in the sections previous to the housing that um, one section in particular, which was there was a request for um, a summer committee on mobile homes and uh, it was a very general proposal. We had passed H213 earlier this year, and so we inserted that material for that particular committee into the the bill that you have um, the that we passed out of our committee um, and I'm not sure if we need to do a section by section but the the housing portions of this bill were stripped in the Senate because they had appropriations attached to them and the way that the Senate does their work is because we get the budget first they tend to strip out sections that have money attached to them and so what we ended up what we started with was very bare bones housing material and we needed to go back to the senate as past the committee to get an understanding of what their impulses were to make it a home bill you know housing for everybody bill 
And in fact, up until then, it, it had turned into basically a zoning and Act 250 bill. So we, so our work concentrated on primarily bringing the, the Senate bill back to what had passed. We will have an amendment that won't affect your work in this committee that will deal with some rental issues as well. Um, but that will be presented. What we're doing work on that this week. We didn't have time in this compressed session to address the, some of those issues that we wanted to deal with um, prior to needing to get the bill to you. So what, what is in the section of the bill that we worked in um, includes the VHIP program, which is the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, which is, a, which is a program that started a couple of years ago as a pilot program of federal money. This is the first year that there was a request to um, use tax do, uh, general fund dollars for that. And so we had to consider that we then, which we did throughout the year with the budget memo um, and, the, and the proposals that had been put forward. So we put that back into the bill, the policy, both the policy language and the appropriation request for, um, for the VHIP program. It's been, a, it's been a, by all accounts, it's been a successful program, which allows a property owner um, the ability to apply for either a grant or a loan for up to $50,000, depending on the size of the unit that, that you're trying to upgrade. And in the past, it was tied into uh, whether it was in code or whether it was code compliant or not. And over the years, it's, it's loosened up and to the point where we are addressing um, things like weatherization and accessibility as, as items that people can bring into code. And that came with a large request of, um, I, I don't remember what we ended up at 15 or $20 million 20, yeah. that 20, 20 for this program. Also a missing what's being called the middle income housing program, which is a program we approved last year that would, um, people would be, developers would, and, and potential owners would be uh, able to qualify for almost like a bridge loan or a bridge grant that would say if it costs $550,000 to build a house, but it's only going to appraise for $500,000, generally speaking, a developer can't build that house. They're not gonna get the loans that are needed, the, the construction loans. And so this is a program that would, um, if, the, if the developer is qualified and goes through the process, they may be eligible to receive that difference between what it costs to build and what it would cost to sell. And then and up to about 35% of what the build price is. And if there's any money left over, that money could be applied to the potential owner of that property in order to, um, and it creates what's called in the housing world, shared equity. And that just means you would, as a house, as a homeowner, you would leave that equity behind when you sold the house, you'd be able to re you'd be able to achieve certain elements of equity depending on how long you lived in the in the house, but that that would keep help keep that house affordable at that level. That it would provide that subsidy moving forward. It's a, it's been a successful program in the past in the affordable housing world, where um, people who generally can't afford a house. Um, are they qualify at a lower level of mortgage and but the the trade off for that is that they don't get a chance to take um, all of the equity with them as they move forward is they, they might move to a bigger house or they may they may not qualify for it any longer for, on an, on an uh, uh, income level so that program we kept in and we also kept the funding up to that pretty much to where it was requested at at fifteen. 15 or $20 million. That was 20 as well. Um, we also included a program for first generation home buyers. These were all things that were in the Senate bill that we had to replace because they had appropriation. So first generation home buyer program is again, something that we started last year with excess funds for, we funded it for a million dollars. VHFA has come in and said, it's been a successful program once they got it up and running and it's going to run out of money, the, the million dollars that we gave to provide $15,000 grants 
to first generation home buyers um, in, in order to try to get an ele elements of our population that have not had the opportunity to build wealth through home ownership. And those, that grant program um, started off, it started off where they needed to set the rules up and it's well underway. And they had asked for another appropriation and we decided to appropriate or make a proposal for appropriation of $2 million. Again, this is money that would be granted to potential home buyers that would lower the costs of buying a home. We also have, um, we, put in, we put in the request for funding up to $50 million to VHCB to continue the work that they've been doing. And that's it, that's on top of the amount given to the property transfer, from the property transfer tax to the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund. But it is specifically to continue the programs that have been in place for the last three years where um, VHCB has been able to work with local organizations to purchase properties and turn them into housing as quickly as possible. Um, it still ends up being a one to two year process, but it's that's a shorter time frame than what happens traditionally with um, VHCB working with local nonprofit housing. We also added in um, a study from that, that did make it across, it didn't get cut out, that was uh, from for fire safety to work on, to look at the building codes and to determine if there's anything in the building codes that they can um, adjust or that they can identify that would help make the materials less expensive in the sense that if there are building codes which do exist and which generally make us need to build at a higher level, are there other ways to still keep those codes in place but make um, some, of the, some of the improvements in the codes less expensive that, that may promote, again, development at a lesser price. Again, the, the price of development of single family homes in particular, and also um, multi-unit buildings, but in, in this case for this bill, has gotten extraordinarily high. <clears throat> and so this, this material, these, these um, proposed um, appropriations, would in theory bring down the price to make it somewhat more affordable to people buy, building and buying. And I think that's where I'll leave it for now. Um, these are programs that we've worked on in committee for many years. Our committee took a lot of testimony earlier in the year on these programs when we were dealing with the budget. Um, Memo. What's that? Revolving loan. And then there's a revolving loan proposal. Thank you for that. That's a $20 million proposal from VHFA which says that um, for multi-unit buildings that are being built for people at a uh, certain level <coughs> income, they, uh, a developer may receive upwards, like the middle income home program, a subsidy per unit of $100,000 if they are building apartments that are for people between 80% of the area median income and 150% of the area median income. So we're the missing middle is more about the, the economics of, of people who make a certain amount of money. We know that the area median income across the state is different. It's different in Chittenden or Franklin County than it is in Orleans or Caledonia County or in Rutland County. And so we use these percentages, which are, which are expressed through um, HUD programming. So there would be about $100,000 per unit up to a certain number of units for that level. And if you were building apartment units that were going to be affordable to people between 60% or 65% of AMI and 80% of AMI, then it would be about $150,000 per unit. So those are things that the, if, the, if that proposal goes forward, a revolving loan fund in, in our world simply says, if, I, if I'm loaning out $500,000 to help you build these things, that gets paid off over time. And that money goes back into the revolving loan fund to be then lent out. Mm -hmm. And at some point, if we continue to fund this, if it proves to be successful in its first trench, then if we continue to add money to that over time, it would take care of itself because the money would keep would would go out and then it would be coming back in with people who um, have utilized that loan over paying it off. So those are the main highlights of what we did. Um, we did have questions about about um, zoning issues and about Act 250 issues. But again, we tried to keep the boundary in the discussions because of the shortness of time and for this committee.
All right. And so that's um, I'm passing. I'm passing. Time. OK, great. Thank you for that. Um, I want to acknowledge that some members have joined us um, since we did introductions. So, Avram, would you introduce for the group yourself? Um, uh, hi, I'm uh, Avram Pat. I represent uh, the uh, one of two representatives representing the Lamoil Washington uh, district, along with Representative Lamont. And I live in uh, Worcester. And uh, I have been involved uh, primarily in, in energy issues over the years, both in the legislature and in, in my work before that. And a couple um, at the end of the table also. I'm Mary Howard. I represent Rutland District 6, and I have been on the housing committee for a number of years. So housing is um, definitely <laughs> not new to, to me. Um, thank you. Good morning. Senator Vermont, Memorial Washington District, alongside Avram. Remember. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you, Representative Stevens, for that overview. <clears throat> um, I can talk a little bit about where we are in our process, although we haven't gotten, um, obviously, we're just starting. Uh, we started taking up um, housing, the housing conversation last week in our committee, and we kind of framed it. You, you all still had position of the bill, and so we framed it um, under H68, which was a bill that Representative Bongarts introduced, and I'm, I'm probably going to have him maybe just talk a little about his process on that bill. Yeah, um, in, a, in a minute, but um, so we started talking about the housing issues, looking at some of the issues we know we're in S100 last week, and now we have it in our possession, and so we'll be taking it up fully. Um, I guess what I would say is that when we get a new bill into our committee, I ask uh, my committee members and myself to uh, keep an open mind and to say, like, you know, what's the problem we're being asked to solve here, and how. How does this bill address those problems? And that we're still we're still pretty much in that place. Um, you can see that we've heard from a lot of witnesses. We're still hearing from a lot of witnesses. We certainly haven't heard from everyone on all the topics in the bill yet, but we will do our best to do that. Um, you know, and I guess with that, I would just say I think it's maybe important because a, a big portion of the zoning pieces in the bill are grounded in H-68, which Representative Bongart's introduced, putting a little bit on the spot because I can give you a heads up, but I know that a lot of it's in your back pocket. And really, I don't need you to talk about the content as much as the, just the background on your process when you, how you did, how you got to H-68. Sure. So what I did actually two years ago, Kathleen and I worked jointly over the summer on a housing bill um, that be, can't remember the number that it became for now, can't remember the number that it became, uh, but we pulled together a group of stakeholders, um, and that bill actually, was, relatively speaking, passed into law last year. This summer, I pulled together a group of stakeholders, uh, and over the course of the summer and fall, um, everything from you know, uh, v VHCB, three directors of regional planning commissions, a couple of town planners. Um, Vermont Housing Finance, the Vermont Natural Resources Council, the Office of Racial Equity. Um, we were in touch throughout with um, the League of Cities and Towns. We invited them into the process. They declined to, to be involved directly. I'm leaving out uh, half the people that we involved, but a group of 12 to 15 stakeholders that met, uh, um, obviously Evernorth, by the way, or Housing Vermont, as we may, some may still think of it. Um, and we decided, uh, also, by the way, the uh, Department of uh, uh, Housing and Community Development, um, and that we decided we just wanted to, there's a lot of elements to the housing issue. We decided to just focus on one of them and try to do it really well. And um, so we focused on uh, uh, the zoning and the fact that zoning can often have, um, you know, and I always say I believe in Vermont unintentional, but uh, but it can have discriminatory impact and make it harder for people to uh, 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 lower incomes to live in downtowns. And so we really wanted to focus on to the extent that there's a, uh, a major housing issue in Vermont and to the extent that the conclusion that we reach is that we need to, in one way or another, bring about either the construction 
or reuse of buildings to uh, develop whatever the number, uh, you know, there's different numbers floating around with 30 to 40,000 units. The way that we looked at it as is <clears throat> we, uh, if you're going to try to bring those kinds of units online, uh, what you don't want to do, uh, what, what you want to try to do is do it in downtowns because the alternative is sprawl. The alternative is building in farmland and forest land. And so we tried to focus on how, to the extent we can do this, we can make that happen in downtowns with the byproduct, of course, being that, you know, uh, uh, housing in downtowns leads to vibrant downtowns. Um, so that's what that's what we did. And I won't go into the details, although I will say that some of the uh, just a few of the highlights that really that. So, by the way, then what happened is that Senator on Hinsdale picked up a, uh, age 68 with, with my blessing and made it the center of the bill that we're now working on. And most of what we had in the bill, which you know went to the things like uh, in certain areas, um, areas with, with sewer and water, um, you know, a minimum density of allowed of five units per acre, um, the duplex by right, um, the, the by right provision, uh, meaning that, um, you know, if you're allowed five, you can't get that whittled down through the, through the process by NIMBYism, frankly. Um, and those, most of those things that we had in the bill as the starting point uh, are, came back and are now contained in S100. So that's the, that's the foundation of H100, um, I mean S100. A lot of things, the thing, all the things that the general committee has been working on were added um, in the, by the Senate on the, you know, if you will, on the ends of the bill. Um, and so that's the, that's the background of the work that started this over the course of the summer. We met, um, we worked for months and uh, went through 15 or 16 drafts, a meeting every, sometimes every week and sometimes every other week by Zoom. Um, and that's, that's the process. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> like open it up for members <coughs> to discuss. Uh, Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, so far in this meeting, I've heard talk of housing, housing and housing, the appropriations for housing, we, our committee is environment and energy. I believe that this bill should be separated somewhere so that the housing can be addressed as much as the Act 250 uh, uh, idea should be. So uh, I'm just a little confused as to why we are addressing a housing bill. Yeah, well, so we're addressing the land use parts of it and certainly land use affects housing. But it is in one bill. Indeed. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think it should be separate. There should be two bills here. And I'm not saying they're either good or bad bills. I'm just saying that I think there are two separate uh, subjects that should be addressed by the committee. I hear you. We're, yeah, let's. Just the third of that. That's actually what we were trying to do with the bill with H68 was have the one portion of it be the land use bill, but it got turned into um, omnibus bill. It's actually very similar to what happened with 226 last year. Which you'll recall, uh, our committee uh, focused on land use portions, and and the housing committee yeah. focused on other portions. It worked very smoothly, and we got the bill through. Okay. Yeah. If I may, I, I would like to ask Chair Stevens a question too, just for clarification. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, the first generation home buyer is a two million dollar. Is it a forgiveness loan or is it a payback loan? It's a grant. Well, so it's a it's a it's a grant to qualified home buyers, um, rather than a loan, or rather than um, a forgivable loan. It's simply a, it's a grant. It's a new, okay. it's a first time I believe we've worked on anything at this level um, of a grant uh, that hasn't had the loan tied to it, much like um, much like even the VHIP program is, which is federal grant. Uh, no, this would be using. Uh, state tax dollars. Um, last year, when we last year when we created the idea of this program, and again, VHFA did phenomenal work in making it um, making the language work so that it includes that it was all inclusive um, to any first generation home buyer. Um, there was a million dollars that had been appropriated the year before in a bill that had been vetoed, but the amount had passed through. And so we used that money, which was, which I believe was federal money, to create the idea, the proposal last year. This year, the money requested 
is from general fund dollars. Right. Thank you. Other members? <clears throat> Representative Sibelia. Yep. Uh, so really excited to be in this joint environment, have a couple of um, issues that Madam Chair, I've talked with you about. I don't know if they actually are relevant for our committee or for this broader committee and just um, thinking about in terms of housing generally, <clears throat> Um, I'm not sure where uh, or who is keeping track of how much housing we need to build, um, how much housing has been built, um, at what um, level of affordability that housing is at, um, if we are building housing for the middle class. Uh, and so I have been starting to put together some thoughts um, uh, and communicating those with you, Madam Chair, um, and also have spoken with Commissioner Hanford. I'm not sure if that, that is actually in our committee or something that we should be um, talking with the Housing Committee about. Um, I'd like to see us have some more <coughs> language around counting um, and reporting back to us on progress. Um, another issue that I'm not sure um, which committee would take up, um, one of the elements of the Rural Caucus Amendment is uh, this Rural Recovery Coordination Council. One of the things that's really apparent when we look at this bill, to me anyway, is that you know I can see lifeboats starting to leave rural Vermont uh, for places that don't have sewer and water uh, or other critical infrastructure. And so this council would be one that helps um, our communities um, really start to grapple with our communities that are able to really start to grapple with these infrastructure issues, which are pretty limiting for housing. So that's another element. Again, that's part of the Rural Caucus Amendment. I'm not sure where that would get taken up. Um, so those are two things that I want to put on the table. Okay, thanks. May I address the count? Do you have time to address the count? Let me see. I want to see if... Sure. Um, any, other, any other just member comments? Or, yes, um, Representative Bartley. Thank you. Um, I, I definitely would... I think that's a, a great idea and understanding where we are and where we need to be. I know we've all heard that, or at least our committee has heard that we need 40,000 units in the next 10 years. I think some of us aren't sure if that's really how much we need or, or what there is out there. So I think that's really important. Um, a concern that I've had is kind of because these are separated, how should somebody who is concerned about that um, in environment and energy come to us, we've already voted it out. How are our concerns going to be heard? Can we join a, a, or sit in on a committee? Are we going to be asked, are we going to be able to ask questions ourselves? Um, I, I just, this process has been a little frustrating for me. Um, and so I'm just wondering, it sounds like that should be a general and housing question that we address um, and can that be put back into the bill and how would that how would we do that yeah so process wise there's always <clears throat> amendments i think uh, representative Stevens already mentioned that there's likely to be you're likely to have an amendment and then it would if it's an area that's in in those er, this sections of statute that are in one of the committee's particular areas of jurisdiction then it, then it would go there members are always welcome to and actually enabled by our current technology in your free time to watch our hearings and learn more about it and join our process as we go through it if you'd like and of course individuals are always um, able to bring forward amendments on any bills um but did you want to talk about the count also yes um representative Sibelia. so of course we took testimony <coughs> and updates from the numerous organizations that are i mean in, in particular though bhcb and um and DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development. So the VHIP program itself, which is bringing units back online and um, has, has netted approximately just over 400 units. That was um, units that are geared towards primarily finding residents who were experiencing homelessness. Uh, and if those tenants weren't able to be found, they would be available to tenants who are at 80% of AMI, the area median income. And then if a tenant there couldn't be found at that level, then the property owner would be allowed to, with approval from the department, to rent to uh, anybody at the at a market price. Um, 
So I'm going to actually just interrupt for a second. Yeah. I mean, that's a little too bit too details. into the details. I think just that's a, it's a topic on the table is um, that question of who's keeping track and count. Um, Representative so, Bartley, I want to make sure I actually got to your point in that if you have a topic you want to put on the table, now you could do that. I don't, you. Sure, I, I'm, I'm concerned um, about Act 250. I want to make sure that we, I know from when the bill was in Senate Economic Development, um, there was a decent amount of Act 250 reform and zoning, and then that kind of got significantly watered down in Senate Natural Resources. That's a very large concern for me. We've heard um, you can't build houses without land, um, and keeping it to the designated downtowns, that's 0.3% Vermont. Um, and, and so who, or I guess the question is, who do you plan on having testify and, and do you have a course of action on how you're going to address Act 50 reform? Um, sure, I mean, we've already had folks in to testify. You're welcome to look at who we've had in. Um, I actually had our legislative council do a summary of all the work we've done on Act 250 in the past five years. I can share that with you. We are pretty, you know, we've, we've, many of the members who have been on the committee for those years have spent a, a lot of time doing a lot of testimony on Act 250 and have passed a number of <clears throat> um, bills. And I think as your committee is aware, we are waiting to hear back on two really important <coughs> topics um, with reports coming back to us before the next session. And, you know, those of us who've been working on Act 250 all these years were holding off taking up Act 250 issues until we got the reports back. Um, but this bill has brought it forward. So we're going to take it up. Thank you. Yeah, Representative Thank Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I guess I, this is a procedural <laughs> question. Um, um, I know Representative Sibeli touched on a little bit about water and sewer issues. And um, from the standpoint of uh, addressing those water and sewer issues as far as capacity goes and how it's a, a strain on certain, uh, might be a strain on certain cities and towns. I mean, uh, that's one of the uh, one of the issues that uh, I know that Rutland City has. As a matter of fact, the mayor's here today and we discussed a little bit about that this morning. So um, if there was something in the bill um, that had to do with water and sewer issues as far as, you know, the the capacity, uh, you know, adding new, new, you know, more, more rooms, more toilets, and how it affects the uh, mm -hmm. the capacities. So, would that um, procedure be to have an amendment on that? Um, would that uh, be addressed in, in our committee, or, or um, that would be in our committee? Yeah, it would. And I actually invited DEC to come in. They are, they were not available um, for when we invited them, but we are. We're going to explore that topic absolutely, okay. since it's a pretty big part of this. Okay. And the other issue I have is is not issue. The question I had is the is the timeline on on this bill. Mm -hmm. Are we are we looking to get this done this year? Is it going to be one of those complicated things where we have to you know? It sounds to me like a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to work that out. Okay. Yeah. As it, as as we dig in and kick the tires and figure out. What we're comfortable with now that's ready to move and what is it thank you <coughs> representatives james oh oh sorry representative morris and then james oh thank you uh, representative stevens uh, uh thanks uh for the information on on the just a clarification on the uh two million dollars for first generation home buyers so i'm a parent my kids would not be eligible for that because it is what, what do we mean by first generation? Um, it was defined, and the definition of it was updated after one year to, to what's in the bill, which is, yes, your children would not be eligible because um, if, if, in fact, you have owned a home, um, they would not be considered first generation home buyers. Correct. That, that's what I understood. I just wanted to yep. Yep. get a clarification for sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Jane. Could you, uh, Chair Sheldon, could you remind folks, please, about the two Act 250 reports that are due, um, what, those, what those topics are? I know they're significant. I know we're waiting on them, and I've lost, lost the thread on when they're due and what they're going to cover. Yeah, so one is on the designated areas, and um, they are both underway. 
And that is um, just looking at the process, like those designated areas, it's important for folks to understand that they were not intended to be a land use tool. Like they weren't a regular, they're not a land use regulation tool. They actually um, primarily came from the housing uh, they're, they're a taxation tool. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, kind of a, so we're looking at them. There are currently five and this bill kind of looks to enhance them. And, it, and it, it's a little um, bit, uh, maybe a little bit of cart before the horse. But again, we're going to look at the proposals in the bill as they came to us and see how it fits in with the more specifics of the study that, um, and that's a study that's happening at ACCD, it's doing the designation, um, looking at that. And then the other study is um, primarily on location-based jurisdiction um, and the Natural Resources Board is, is spearheading that one. And um, what that means to me, they're very similar uh, because what we've started to do is use the designations for location-based jurisdiction, um, but you know, the question that has arisen in, in the conversations and the years of talking about Act 250 reform updating is um, what, like, what is the role of, of statewide land use regulation uh, in the modern era with all of the um, growth of regional planning commissions and, and some of our communities having very advanced planning at the local level? Um, what is the role of that? And, um, you know, how do we want to, what, what, what benefit does it add to Vermonters? So the, the two studies for me will inform that. So the kind of flip side of where do we want development is what are those resources of statewide significance that we um, agree, we don't really wanna have a lot of development in those areas. And so these two, both of these studies are complementary, I hope, and will help inform that conversation. And when I say areas of <clears throat> like natural resources of statewide significance, I think many people's minds go to our ridge lines, our mountain areas, um, places Vermonters go to, um, you know, recreate and enjoy our beautiful state. They go to river corridors, um, and they they may go to other places too. And that's what this study will inform. I hope. <laughs> Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, would it stand to raise that Representative Bongarts has as a bill that will address? The previous question as to separating this bill. Is it stand a reason that we let hundred sit by a little bit and both committees study what bill he's going to be presenting or is presenting before we proceed with S100? Um, I hear your interest in this and it's, I guess we'll take it under advisement. We can uh, consider that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Other members have thoughts? Representative Sibelia. Yeah, just on the Act 250 pieces and past and future work that um, <coughs> will take place, the chair has just detailed um, some important studies that will happen. Um, I've been a little skeptical about our ability to progress with any kind of comprehensive Act 250 reforms. I've seen those kind of um, miss with rural Vermont. And, you know, I, I just want to put on the table that I've actually reached out to VNRC um, and others um, as these studies progress uh, to, to work specifically with rural Vermont. Um, uh, with the Rural Caucus and others on issues related to uh, rural infrastructure um, in our rural communities to see if we can make more progress um, in terms of those comprehensive reforms. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we can also move some of these questions in this bill this year. I would not support actually separating these bills out. Um, I would support us doing what we can. I appreciate the chair bringing the two committees together to see if how we can um, work together on this bill and us getting the best bill out that we can this year. Um, Vermonters, I think, really need us to do something on housing. So, and it's time is ticking. Representative Chestnut Tangerman. Uh, sorry, that's um, <laughs> I'm just doing my best to get everybody. To, every the names day, I'm not used to calling on don't roll off my tongue, but I think I'm getting. I usually cut a couple syllables out. <laughs> um, so I, I um, am, am very aware of 
Representative Sebelius' concerns about rural, that the rural areas have the opportunity to take advantage of, of funding and programs. And um, one thing that I think our committee has um, kept in the, in the forefront is asking about the, f the funding programs. You know, mm. Where will they, where are they useful? Are there, you know, uh, um, and one of the pieces of information we heard was that the VHIP program has actually had more uptake rurally than, than in population centers, which is very encouraging. Um, but it is something that we have been, it's been in the, in the conversation, precisely your concerns, that it, that it be, the benefits be statewide, not regional, and across all economic sectors. Representative Stevens. And following up on that, thank you, Chair. Um, following up on that, you know, the, the mission statements of organizations like VHCB and VHFA um, is to be statewide organizations. And while there has been some, uh, with the federal money up to date, there's been testimony we took show that, that more projects have happened in more um, populated areas that there's been a commitment also from those organizations to focus to make sure that they fulfill their mission, which is to make sure that the resources are available to provide um, on an um, even equity basis. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing things get built, we're seeing housing get purchased and built. And I think we need to always remember that it's always going to be a two to three year process because whether it's nonprofit or for profit housing, they need to undergo the same permitting processes and the same same funding processes, but not the same funding processes, but they have to go through funding processes, which are extremely complicated at times as it is for the private industry. So things are getting built. Things are happening. Um, what I appreciate about the conversation about where development could happen in rural areas is that if when rural areas band together like this, they can try to get something done and really focus the 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 um, conversation on what the needs are in rural communities in a different way than than has happened in the past. And I we should all we should all appreciate that and try to make changes that address that the addresses that we're making, whether or not it's in zoning or whether it's in funding, is an important. There are important steps along the way but the housing won't show up in June. Um, we have to keep addressing these issues in their long-term. Um, some of the programs are shorter term, but they're still a long-term solution. And I think I, it, I, one of the proudest things I can say is that the committee's the fact that we're sitting together shows that how integrated housing and all of the other portfolios are um, across, across our um, state house because We've operated in silos before that haven't been as efficient as they should be. And so while this conversation may seem a little rough at times, it is really a step forward in integrating all the different pieces that go into building housing across the state. Yes, I, I have a question or a housing um, yeah, question about, I think we heard yesterday that we had a certain population, something 2,000 of <coughs> unhoused Vermonters, um, and then we've we've sort of built or put online housing for those, and we still have the same population of unhoused. So, how do we wrestle with that? Like, I'm curious, what how do we get a handle on that? Um, again, this is a conversation. The answer is. Um, I don't know. You know, we as a system don't know. We yeah. have, again, to, to appreciate the fact that we've housed <laughs> over 3,000 households over the last, since May, March of 2020. Yeah. That was and yet we still have this tide rolling in of, of the same number of folks. I think it's a, it's a deep systemic issue about poverty, about the amount of housing. You know, it is not simply about the units, though that's important. If we do not have the other th two legs of the stool, which are the services and the funding, then the folks won't 
be able to sustain that house. So it is a it is a question that we're wrestling with in our committee. We're wrestling with it in the human services committee. Um, the folks who remain unhoused are need supports that we are trying to provide. But again, it's out of balance. And so no, it's it. We only gave an hour for this conversation. We could be here for a couple of days anyway. Others. Representative Lamont. Oh, Representative Lamont. Thank you. Yes. No, I just wanted to chime in on, on that. A lot of it is because of the influx of people entering homelessness, right? And and what we're learning, what we learned at our joint hearing in this very room a couple of months ago was that that is not affecting only low-income Vermonters. That is affecting middle-income Vermonters, et cetera, because when we look at our housing stock, we have people who have homes that are too large where they have lived and they would like to downsize. However, it's not affordable for them to do that because they would save money by staying in their home that is way too large, but there's no housing that is affordable for them to move into. And so what, we're, what we have is a housing stock issue and a systemic issue because it's not, we, we, when we're looking at it from angles of only addressing certain dimensions of this, whether we're looking at affordability, whatever that may mean, or we're looking at accessibility, whatever that may mean. We've heard testimony that majority of the people experiencing, what is it, 70? 78. 78% of the people experiencing homelessness are people with disabilities, right? And so when we're looking at what types of housing are available, the types of housing that are available are not available. And so that, I think as we're addressing this issue, it's really important to look at the types of housing that we're going to have available, not only where they will be built, but accessibility and what that looks like and design to help mitigate some of that. Because when we're looking at that, the middle income Vermonters who would like to downsize need some place to go to, <laughs> right? And that will free up some housing for families and people who are coming to Vermont for jobs and opportunities who can't find housing. And one piece in your zoning world is going to be talking about shelters yeah. and about the ability to regulate how long shelters can be open, which is not a simple issue. Um, here in Montpelier, the winter shelters open at 7 p.m. and they close at 7 a.m. And then there's a day shelter that opens. At, so it is something that you will directly address in terms of what the communities, what you're going to hear may not be the simple, it's not a simple section. Yeah, we took a little testimony on that yesterday. Yeah. Um, yes, Representative Burroughs. Um, <clears throat> what, dovetailing with, with what Representative Lamont said, uh, we also have, uh, we, we took testimony on, what's the name of the rental relief, COVID rental relief fund? VRAP. 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 We took testimony on, uh, the ending of VRAP and uh, the number of people who are renting for more than 100% of their income, uh, which I think was 4%. Um, so there are 4% uh, of VRAP recipients. Um, so there are going to be more, more people um, added to the ranks of, of uh, people who need help. Mm -hmm. All right, members, I'm not seeing any hands. Representative I really appreciate the work of the Housing Committee. It's been great. I think everything that you've talked about, I'm going, this is, this is all. Some of, the, some of the, some of the amendment that you know, the Get Out addresses, um, Senator Burroughs was talking about in terms of providing some relief that will, um, you may not see that directly in your committee, but if, if we get it out as a committee, then you'll see it later. And I'll, I never want to like leave a meeting on a high note. Um, there are organizations. <laughs> That's why I'm chairing. And just <laughs> <laughs> there are organizations that are talking about this. Just to, I do not 
as much as I'm proud of the work that we're doing that we're that we've done, I just always am reminded by the sober comments made by organizations that work directly with this population. And they are talking about buying tents for people right now. And so again, changing zoning isn't going to get people into housing at the end of June. But to keep in mind that there are going to be upwards of two to five thousand hunters who are going to be leaving subsidized services that have been provided mostly but not solely by the federal government in the next several months. It's just sobering to know that that the, the, the skills that we have brought to the fore are being put aside for a moment for the because we have to buy tents and sleeping bags for Vermonters because it's summer and they can sleep outside. It's not, it's a very, I won't say anything except for my personal morals is that's a difficult thing to hear and to, and to work with um, in the face of the work that we're already doing. And so that's what keeps me awake. That's what keeps me focused on. So thank you for joining. Uh, thank you. Work. And um, thank you all for your um, participation and your, your passion and concern for Vermonters and the housing crisis that we're in. So with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>